that's what Yep. Hello, everyone. Yeah, thanks for coming in a uh, uh, rainy day to talk about this, you know, Microsoft and Azure stuff. And uh, my name is George Arteiro. Some of you don't know me yet. Um, and we're going to talk about Azure API management consumption layer, use case. And, um, I used to be a Microsoft MVP. I just started to work for Microsoft five days ago. <laughs> and now I'm on the other side of the fence. And you guys can ask anything, yeah? Very nice questions now, please. Let's see if you can go. Click uh, Bill, it's not working, Bill. what we did. Yeah, there you go. See if we go back, yep. yep. There you go. Yeah, that's the idea today is to talk about, um, you know, what's API gateway. I think Bill had like an overview of what uh, API management is, but what's a gateway is for APIs. And then we're going to see API management itself um, all these Microsoft, uh, Microsoft uh, microservice architecture being used by those gateways and by API management. And um, what that consumption layer means for API management is a new layer, that they are, a new, like a new offering from, from API management product. And we're going to discuss the Azure functions and uh, AKS, that's Kubernetes cluster, um, using those API management consumption layer, okay? API Gateway itself, okay, if you forgot about any product and you, our API Gateway is something that you can get clients calling in a HTTP endpoint, and you're going to be on this gateway here, you get the call, you have some kind of authentication where your gateway will be like an engine. I think about a gateway is, you know, it's just like a piece of software that gets a HTTP call HTTPS call, and they're going to do some things for us. Normally when you have a, you know, a API, the first thing that we need is authentication. We have to know who is calling, if they're authorized to, to, you know, to be calling this API. That's, that's the locker here. Then you normally have integration from the gateway with your authentication system. It could be a JWT token, JWT token, okay, or any other kind of integration that you can do from your gateway. Then think now the gateway is a piece, like a smart piece of software, okay, that's fully managed by someone that's providing that gateway as a product, okay. You normally don't write API gateway unless you, you know, maybe, maybe like five, 10 years ago, but not anymore. Now we have products that can do that for us. And now we you think as API gateway as a component, Okay, you're not going to write that, you're going to get the component and, and start using that. You may be writing on the client application, mobile or a web application, but not the gateway. Then the gateway can do like the routing. Let's say your API using microservice, then you have like multiple service, complete different implementations. Okay, and these things are not deployed together. The gateway and those service are completely independent. The gateway could be running on Azure, the service could be running different places on premise, different clouds and on Azure as well, and they are completely independent of each other. What that gateway is going to do is receive the call, do the authentication, do like SSL offloading, because here maybe you like in a, in a safe place, you could be doing like a, a, you know, a private networking here where you don't need SSL inside that conversation here, then you can do SSL offloading. You can do like all this routing. You can do caching for the response. That's very important when you think about serverless because serverless we pay by consumption. And then if you call your backend all the time just to get something that's in memory is already in cache, that's going to pay twice. 
you're going to pay for the calls. Imagine if you don't have to go for the service. You can just get from the one cache system like Red's cache and just send the response back. And after five minutes, you can refresh the cache. And then they have to go on the back end again. But that means you're saving, you know, the costing reduction will be a lot. <laughs> Even like when you start thinking about you know, functions and all these things. Where if you're moving for serverless because of all the consumption, all the cost, then that can help a lot with your consumption as well. And logging is another component. Okay? That's like the main components of like API Gateway. But API Gateway can do many things. Depending on the vendor, they're going to do more things. Okay? We, you can have some very simple gateways. You can have very you know, sophisticated and like advanced like gateways. And now we're going for Azure API management gateway. I'm not talking about the product. I'm talking the gateway of the product. Okay? Because just focus on the gateway. You know, Azure API manages more than just a gateway. They have all the management. Like they have like a control plane for your for your gateway to help you to manage that, to help you to you know for your developers from your organization, for external organizations to use this gateway. And now. You think about you have internal customers and you have external customers in your organization. That's like one you know, architecture that some enterprise companies are using these days, where they have you know, not just internal but external ones. And Azure API management lets you to get this gateway here. They provide you a gateway. On the Azure portal, you can do all the customization, create your policies for caching, create your policies for SSL offloading, and all these, you know, logging, uh, authentication. You can load all that configuration settings for this gateway on the Azure portal. And, um, but the main thing here is um, when someone internally calls this gateway, they call on this endpoint. That's a unique endpoint for the whole gateway. You can deploy multiple APIs there. Okay, you can deploy multiple microservices, but you'll be a single endpoint. You will be like your HTTPS, your domain, slash API one, you know, slash API two, and then you have all the APIs using the single endpoint. Then that endpoint is very important um, because that's the, one of the main things. Okay, um, when someone is going to call your API or gateway now, that's a, you know a group of APIs. They're going to have a unique IP number. Then they can do a white listing. Okay, they have a single domain that's very easy for them to manage as well, external partners to manage. The same thing for the application gateway. They have another endpoint. Application gateway, if you don't know, on Azure, is another thing. It's not part of uh, API management. It, uh, it's, a, it's another software that you know, is going to give you like SSL offloading. Is going to give you routing, some caching. But what normally we do here, we expose some APIs or some say, external APIs and internal APIs. If you have to expose anything for the outside world, we just expose those endpoints here, the green endpoints. The internal API is just exposed for the internal consumers. That's one option. There are many ways to deploy Azure API management in your product you know, in your organization. That's one way to do it. Some people don't use that application gate at all. Why that application gate is important for enterprise and because they have like web application firewall in there. See, there are more features. That's not really part of like a gateway. It's more like a network and firewall features. That's all part of application gateway. But if you want to have a, a API greater just like inside your organization, you can just go for, for that endpoint without those components here. And you can make these all be inside your private network. It's not even you know, uh, exposed on the, net, on the internet. It could be just internal uh, domain inside your VNet on Azure. And that's very, very important for, you know, for enterprise. And, um, any question on that? I think. Uh, so with this approach, will not will the API management gateway not become a single point of failure? 
this one here, you mean? OK, that's, that's a good question. Um, all these products, application gateway and API management, they are, you know, depends on the tier that you buy. You know, they are high scalable and available, all these things. It's like you think this product as a platform, as a service. You don't manage anything. It's all managed by then. They give a SLA that for most of the tiers are 99.99% uh, and um, they manage all these things for us. The only thing you do you, you can, you know, is scaling. How many instances? They, they tell you, say, one instance is one instance, but it's not like a physical instance, like a unit. They call it a unit. It's like a capacity that you buy. Doesn't mean that they deploy one instance, okay? They have, they have redundancy to make sure that's high available. But they, they, they tell you, say, I stand LA, I can give you 2,500 calls a second or something like that, okay? They give you like a performance rate and they have availability as part of the product itself. Okay. And uh, if you want a um, mode region, then you have like a premium layer where you can deploy in multiple regions. As you can deploy Sydney, Melbourne, or another country, and they're all part of the same class. But they do, they deploy, you know, traffic manager on top of that, and they can, but they manage the whole thing for us. It's a platform as a service. If you try to do that yourself, you probably have to create all these, you know, um, all these traffic managers, all these load balances to do that. Um, on the product, think about API managers as a platform as a service. It's out of the box, you don't manage anything. And um, when you look at the cost, you have to understand exactly what I'm saying. It's not about you know, how much cost, it's everything that they are managing for us. If you try to do that yourself, creating VMs, probably be more expensive than. Yeah, so as I, as I spoke earlier, um, when they're doing upgrades, if you have any tier above developer, you won't get, you won't notice the upgrade happening because there's multiple um, servers running in the background. Even at the basic tier, the developer is the only one that doesn't really have that. Yep. So um, it is your single point, but it is um, highly available um, okay. without you doing anything. It's just basically yeah. the way they built the servers. Yeah. They pretty much manage the high availability in, in for us. Yeah. Um, because you don't see the VMs, you don't see, but they, they manage that for us. That's why, otherwise they're never going to give you 99.99% of you know, availability on that, or it'd be impossible for them to, to give that for us. But I think that's a good point, and, um, and anything else? Could you also summarize why would you use API M? So I can yep. understand one is for security. So you said you have whitelisting white only yep. From your APM, you can go into your internal network. No one else can go, so you have to go by that way. So you only open one small hole in your, like you know, DMG zone, DMZ zone okay. to come into your network. I think I think the question is repeating the question. The question is why we need API management yes. on your thing. Um, the microservice bringing you know API management more as a subject because you're now spreading your you know APIs in multiple small pieces of software, mm -hmm. and if you if you mix that with containers. I mean, you can have very small piece of software running everywhere. And, um, and you can have you know, external APIs. So you, can, you could buy a SS, SMS API from Telstra. You could buy any you know, things. And that becomes like multiple endpoints that you have to manage. Once you, I like to call this a consolidation of your APIs. And when you consolidate, then you, you can now makes sense you know, to consolidate how you do caching, you do authorization, authentication, all these other things. And that's you know, uh, transformation of data as well. You know, and uh, imagine if everyone has to implement authentication and authorization on the API. Or now just say, okay, the developers, they don't have to care about this thing. They don't have to care about you know, how they're going to cache. That's all be managed by another layer. And that's make you know, the development very you know, faster as well. You save time. And if you ask five developers to develop, implement like caching or all these things, then the authentication will be hours different implementations. And uh, once you move that up and you know, helps a lot, that's, that's um, you know, different ways to answer your question. But for me, I think that's a more important thing. And, um, and if you think about some of those things, 
Uh, sometimes it's not a developer doing it's like an integration or operation person manage those things because they are more you know capable for managing these other components than the developer and then become more like an operational thing. The other big thing yeah. too is with the API management um, on the tiers That's above cool. consumption, yeah. you can basically, it's a place for your developers to discover the APIs. So if you go in there, you get a list of the APIs, you can subscribe to the API, you get all the details about the API, you can test it, all of that kind of stuff. Um, for uh, some older services, legacy services, you can do things like they've got features of exposing a SOAP service as a REST service, and they do that translation in API management instead of you having to write code. Yeah, yeah that, that's a big one. Roast, uh, SOAP to REST was a feature they introduced like a year and a half ago or something, and then that's saving time, lots of time from everyone. You know, you want to modernize your API, but you don't want to rewrite the API from scratch. And now it takes five minutes to get your SOAP API and publish on, on, on API M. And for the external world, that would be a REST API. And the products do all the transformation of the, you know, of the payload. Because SOAP API is just like a post. I was a post with operation inside of the, you know, of the payload. That's like XML things. And then all the translation and you know, call the, the, the back end is all done by the product. So, oh, a lot of templates, and they do all, they, they even create the templates for us if you give you know, the, the API definition, the, the SOAP definition. That's very handy and you know, saves, I think, hundreds of hours of development. But now we have a new consumption. You know, we can go on the product, you guys can see exactly all those features and how it really works. But the new thing that we want to talk today is the consumption tier. They've, people used to complain that the product was expensive and they used to have like standard, you know, and uh, developer standard and premium. And I think the standard used to be like $800 or something. Or, and people say, I want something, you know, more entry level. And they create like a basic, basic layer that's like $300 or something. And then, and now they create what they call consumption layer. You just pay for exactly what you call. If you don't call, you don't pay anything, okay? And that's very fast, you know? It's like the provision is just like a couple of minutes or something, like pretty much bang, done. They, you know, they, they, they just create for us. And um, we don't care about scaling anymore. Like the other layers, we have to say how many units we, we need. Let's say 1,000 calls per second, 2,000 calls per second, so different layers. And, um, here, nah, it's all outscaling, managed by then. High availability, like we said, you know, is included as well. And it's just pay active, how much you call, how many times you call. I think they're still in public uh, preview. I think they're going to give you some free calls as well, like Azure Function does or something. And I think it'll be a good number. I'm not sure yet, but I don't want to say anything. And uh, website, it's a million free calls a month. Yes. Yeah. Hopefully, a million calls is already there on the website. Okay, it's already there, then a million calls, that's it. <laughs> and uh, it's a lot. It means that, you know, if you have small things and you want to start playing with that, probably you don't pay anything. Just go for consumption layer, have a million calls for free. And um, it's in public preview. It's going GA, I think, very soon. And, um, but what they did, to provide this service, they just cut some fe features, you know? Uh, the normal API management, they have what they call, you know, developer portal. If you want to create this, you know, uh, gateway and you have to expose for the developers and the developers can go in a, in a nice, you know, web application, what they call developer portal, and see all the API, see all the operations, like, becomes like a documentation for the operations. They can create, like, subscriptions. They can cancel subscriptions. That's available on the normal layers on the consumption layers, because we think that consumption layers for, for subless, then we say we don't need this development portal, then we remove the development port from the consumption layer. Um, there is no caching as well, but there's a nice thing that everyone was asking for a long time was, I wanna bring my cache. You know, I have a Reds cache, I have MEM cache, whatever. I wanna bring my cache. And they let you now you just 
use Red's cash from Azure as a service. You have to pay extra for that. But then you decide how big you need, you know, how many megabytes you need of caching, and you buy Red's cache the size that you want, and you just connect. Is that easy? One field there, say I want to connect with this cache from my API management. And after that, anything that my you know, gateway, any caching that my gateway is using is using from this red cache. And now it's available on the other layers as well, not just on the consumption. Um, the limits that they're talking about here, they have some limits on the consumption, but just by the number of APIs that you can have. Anything else? We, more than number of APIs and one of the other limitations at the moment, and they're they're looking at this, is that you don't get the static IP like you do with the other levels, because they're running it on a um, multi-tenant infrastructure. So they've got several of these things there. So that's the one thing that some people are missing with the consumption layer is that it, you don't get that static IP address like you did with uh, the other tiers. I think they work on that, I think, but yeah. 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 Static IP is just an extra layer of security, you know, like for some, yeah, you want to do a white listing and, um, but yeah. yeah I mean, <laughs> some people say that, you know, white listing is an old way to do security, but yeah, there's, there are some limitations, but the product, if you look the portal, Look very similar, and with that work that they did for the consumption, they introduced the, like new features. Like uh, now, you can have subscription for you can have a single subscription for any API that you publish here. You can have a subscription for a specific API, or you can have a, a subscription for a product. A product, if you never saw API management, is when you publish your APIs, you can create like a product. It's like a group. I want to group all my APIs, let's say high APIs or you know, office APIs, whatever, and you want to organize those APIs in groups, we call these products. And it used to be the only way to create a subscription. What's a subscription? A subscription is if there is a developer or external user that you want to call this API, we need to give a key for him, what they call a subscription key, for him to be able to call the API. Okay? You can use JWT tokens or everything, but you still need the, you still normally use the API. It's an extra layer of security. And those subscriptions used to be just by product. Then you organize your APIs in groups, and you give a subscription for that group. Now they made more flexible and say, nah, you can have APIs, a, a key just for the API, or you can have a key to call the whole thing. Let's say that you want, to, you want a, a subscription key to give for external partner, and you don't want to have you know, one for each API or for each product, now you can have this. I think that's more flexible. And uh, there's a question there. Do you have a sense for the time frame for generalizability? I don't have yet. Small, I was looking yeah. 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 Should be close. I think seeing public preview for three months, I think, now. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not going to be very much longer. Not it's much longer. Yeah. Yeah. Watch for the build. Yeah. Yeah, we have build coming, and build probably be releasing a few things. <laughs> maybe it'll be a week before build. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, you know that we, you know, release things on on the, on the event, build ignite, and the builds coming as we, you know, in May now. Uh, less than two months, and one month and a half, and then yeah, it's coming. And that's the difference. Okay, we have this developer basic standard and premium, and uh, now you can have you can have this feature that you know. You don't have to reserve capacity here. You have to. That's a big one for like consumption layer, and the scaling. You know, hours on all these things that we discuss. Um, you have to watch that and, and see. Let's see. That's still in public review. On it's called new, but um, I would say that all these serverless, you know, for Azure functions that you're going to discuss now, the use case, that will be. That's it. Let's go, let's, let's prepare for the demo. The idea for the demo is like. Can you go back? Okay. You want to see the features? I think we discussed most of them, but you have a look there. If you want to discuss. 
you know, it's more availability, scaling, capacity, all these things now is all managed by then. So it looks like consumption plan does have most of the features. They have, they have most of the features. I think the only thing they don't have is the developer portal. And um, pretty much that, pretty much that. And some, they, they have to change some things the way they do subscription because, you know, it's more like for serverless things. That means that you're going to create a subscription for like a logic apps to call or someone to call. And then that's kind of a, a little bit different, but the product's very similar. If you look, if we're going to show on the portal, you can see that's very similar. But how are you going to, cons now we have this, okay. We don't have excuse anymore. We have a million calls free for API management. We can use the product, it's very powerful. We can do the you know, authentication, caching transformation, logging, um, a f bunch of things there. And now we have this consumption for some customers, more customers free, for some not pay much. Now there's no excuse to say that, you know, it's expensive or not. And then the nice thing I think they said as well, like they're going to make these, I'm not sure if available yet, but they're going to make that easier to move. If in some stage you say that I'm paying more as consumption than I should be paying a basic layer, you can just move to basic layer, okay? Because now I have enough traffic, then I can move to basic layer and have the full thing. Yeah, so that the, the to, fact that you yeah. to buy a basic, a minimal or a basic for your, workloads, yep. that stopped a few people from getting started because if I've only got a dozen APIs that I want to expose, that's a lot of money for that. If I can go consumption, yep. then I start putting more and more APIs in there, then I might want, and then I can expand up the basic to standard, to premium, whatever I need from that point. So it was really the stopping those people that really wanted to just take, to get their toe in the water, get a, get a feel for what they can do with API management, it was slowing those people down. So that's kind of the, the, the basic yeah. start. That's why things like the developer portal aren't there. So because you typically, if you're doing just a few APIs, you're working with just a few developers so you can give them the swagger for those and it's not a problem. But as you get more and more of your APIs on, you really want that to be self-discovery through the developer portal and those kind of things. So that, that's the, to me, that's the, the approach that they took. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. And, um, and when you think, you know, microservice approach, uh, before we used to deploy all together and, you know, the, your API will be like deployed together with the front end and, you know, most of the web application we deploy all together. Now with this microservice thing that your API could be anywhere, it could be spread. If you're using AKS containers, it would be even more. And they don't, we don't normally don't keep state on those APIs, more like stateless APIs. And now I have this bunch of you know, um, microservices there that a gateway of, in front of that make lots of sense. And, um, and that's where API management is fitting at the moment. You know, the feature will be, some people start discussing what we call in container space or AKS service mesh. Service mesh I think is the evolution of this thing here where you're going to be able to have like a control plane you can talk between the service and you still have all these things that we're talking about. You can still have authentication, but it's all managed by this, what you call service mesh, okay? Um, there's a lot of work being happening at the moment for this. I think that will be next year, probably will be, you know. But, um, and it'll be very easy. I think API management has come to be, become part of this mesh. And um, at the moment, what you do is API management become your, you know, your front gateway for your microservice and everything that we discuss here makes sense. And doesn't matter how many microservices you have, you're going to have a single endpoint that all your applications can call. And makes sense, sometimes in some companies have like multiple teams here developing those services. Let's say the colors, they can have multiple teams developing different things and um, but they're all going to publish on the same place and the products are going to look that as a single thing. I like to say that, the, I used to say that on my presentation like two years ago that, you know, Microsoft Graph API, anyone use Microsoft Graph API? Graph API is an API for the whole Azure, the whole Microsoft thing. Active Directory, Office, everything, you can use Graph API. And pretty much what they did with Graph API is like a, a gateway. They consolidated, used to be, 
one API for Active Directory, one API for Office, one API for Word, one API for any you know, product on, on Azure. And now they have what they call this graph API that's pretty much like a gateway that any Microsoft API is a single endpoint. And it'll be slash Active Directory or something. And they unify, they try to unify the payloads as well to be similar. And that's a big, it's still happening. It's still in development like for years, like last three years, they keep improving this graph API. It's all using this same idea that you guys see here. And um, if you go for functions. Sorry, sir, can, can you come back to the previous one? Yeah, sure. So when one microservice one calls microservice two, it still goes through API management? In this case, you can if you want, but there is an overhead that to go back and come back. And um, so it's yeah. a good practice to do so this. Sort of yeah. I, I think the one thing that it does do for you is that if they change the endpoint for microservice two and you're going direct, yep. you're going to break. If you're going through API management, they've updated it to the same endpoint. It may be calling a different service on a container now or wherever. You've got that consistency that, and, and it really helps your customers too. If they're calling your API and you keep changing the web address once a month, they're going to get annoyed fairly quickly. Where if you're going through API management, you can obfuscate all of that change and be able to deploy new versions and not really bother any, anybody. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, and, that, and I think that's why a lot of people say, but my internal stuff, why do I need to go through that? It's really just for consistency and to basically, if you don't, you get a different experience than your customers. And yeah. that sometimes leads to the fact that, oh, mine worked really nice, but I'm doing this and it doesn't yeah. work. So, um, yeah. In this case here, normally the, you know, the cause is still coming through the, through the gateway. And um, the mesh probably be a solution for that. But that means that the API manager has to move here in between those guys. And uh, I think that's going to happen in some stage. And, you know, it's coming together, I think, with all the containers thing and AKS. Because with containers that make more sense, that's easier to be implemented. Because, you know, it's not like, if you still develop, you know, deploying APIs on, you know, like IIS or something, on VMs, it's still very hard to manage these things. But when you think about containers, what they call sidecar containers, that's just like a, a sidecar container is I get someone, I have my API here, and there is a control plane that brings a new guy next to my API and say, anyone that wanna talk to me, have to talk to you first. Okay, but I don't even know. As a developer, I did my API, I deploy, and there's this magic service mesh control plane that injects a side, side guy or sidecar next to me that knows how to talk to me. And it's all done by the control plane. And this guy will be smart to do SSL offloading, to do like, you know, key rotation, to be safer, like have a minute to rotate the key. And then one that want to talk to me now is a different key. You know, it'd be doing like what they call MTOS. Uh, you can do some caching, you can do all the logging, now it'll be done by him. Everyone that call him, he's going to log somewhere. Then, you understand? Then it's kind of API manager will be here. Will be somewhere injected together with this guy, with this sidecar, to talk to me. Then it's like what you call, you know, um, service mesh, what they call is, is like a lightweight proxy sitting next to your service. Doesn't matter the size of the service. So you have an API. This control plane, I always put this, you know, small proxy next to you, but it's a smart proxy, like a gateway. Then yeah. smart proxy and, you know, application gate, API gate is kind of meshing. It's, kind of, it's going to take some time, but it's going to happen. In that case, will we still, will we still have API M? We still have API manager. API manager will be doing that, you know, that job that we're talking about here. API manager will be sitting next to, to your service in a light way, you know, so it will to do that. Yeah, yeah. In, in containers, there's one thing, they, they do what they call ingress controller. And, uh, you know, any traffic coming from that way and become pretty much like a gateway. 
But look, that's, that's the future. That's very, you know, advanced topic for, for many people still. Uh, for the container space, many people already start doing that with service mesh called STU orders. And, um, but at the moment we're doing, we're doing like that and we, I was, there is some overhead to go back to the, to the, you know, to the gateway. But most of the case is not even, you know, doesn't make much difference at the moment. But I want to go, I think we have something that Bill want to show. Bill has a nice subscription with, you know, API management. My subscription a little bit a mess and I ask Bill to help on that. And I think Bill is the guru with the API management now. There's a lot of workshops and training. And um, um, on the Azure function space that's serverless that, you know, fits very well with the consumption layer. Because on API management, there's options just say, I want to, I want to get the Azure function definition and then I just create API to call those, these Azure functions. It's like publishing the Azure functions, like you know, Azure function proxy or something, you publish it here and use now API management as your, as your you know, entry gateway for your functions. And what's the point here? That's the thing that I was talking at the beginning. Now we can say, we can do caching here you know, on the API gateway layer, and you just call the functions when you need that. Means you're going to save lots of money. Probably the API management to have one million calls for free, you know. I mean, uh, if you cache some things here, and now you have the customer just stopping here, not having to get there because you have the red cache, then you may be going to be saving something. If you're not, even if you're not saving, you're going to save time, you'll be faster. And um, and that's one thing. I think Azure Function has some plan to do to do caching. Yeah, but that's another way. Like not just you know the caching, but now you can do all the features that the the API management can do. And um, that's not available on Azure Function. Normally, have to write some code to do that on, on Azure Function. And um, We go back to the keys and to mode point points, you know, it's kind of a consolidation. And that's where our API management is helping you on that space. Do um, you want to show that, Bill? Yeah, show that, yeah. See if you can drag and drop. Yeah, I mean you can you can you can expose an Azure function directly on the internet. No, I don't want to expose yeah. the proxy. I want to use it to wait that Yep. So basically what we'll do is I've got a you few don't want to pay the proxy. You don't want to pay for the proxy, Azure function proxy. Yeah, I don't I don't want it to be callable from the internet. Yep. Um So th there's a couple of ways you can do that. Number one is if um you don't give them the key that they have to put in the URL, they can't get to it. Yep. So basically, what you do is, this is that consumption-based um, API. So when you go to the new APIs, um, you can see that we have a blank API, open API specification, which for most people that's called swagger. <laughs> um, then you've got Waddle, you've got Wisdle, and then you've got down here, it gives you a list of your logic apps that are in your subscription, 
your function apps that, it, so Azure functions that are in your subscription. So if you click on that, you'll basically go and it'll give you a list of, let's see, why have I got that so big? Let me just go down on the, yeah, let's go down. So basically I'll browse off to my subscription. So basically I'll go here and it'll show me all of the Azure functions that are in my subscription. So this is one I was playing with last night. I'll select that guy. And basically it loads up. So I've got three of them that have HTTP endpoints um, that I can call. And then basically I can go ahead and add those. I created just a integration product just to put things in. These won't have the swagger because I didn't put the I haven't put the swagger in that um, function yet. But I can go and do that either in API management if I don't want to do it in the function. I can do it in API management. Um, I think the the point here is the API suffix that could be could be your gateway domain to flash these suffix to yep. call the API to call these Azure functions. Now you're going to forget about the Azure function URL and you're going to call your API. So here's the, here's the ones that I'm doing. I've got like a, uh, a remove namespace. So if you're familiar with BizTalk, you know what I'm doing. Um, so basically that's the call. You can see here in the settings, this is where it's. You see that you have to find a way to put BizTalk in <laughs> So, but, but there's basically how it's getting. Um, that's going to be the, the URL I call to call this. But basically, if we look at the, um, where's the, oh, so, because it's using function, there's not a, there's not an endpoint there. Yeah, but, yeah you can see, that's the, that's the UI now, the, yeah. the, the gateway. So, in, in, in one, what, one, one of the big features, I think, of API management is if I'm a company, I can then now publish api.company.com, and all my APIs are at that one spot. People can go discover them. They can go use them. Um, and then you get the option now here, you can test your API. So you go into there and you can test directly from the portal. So you just need to put your body in. I don't have swagger, so it's not got, a, doesn't have a sample there. Um, but basically then it'll call off um, and you can add your queries. What I'm going to do, I'm going to step back a little bit from functions on, on you. We mentioned that soap to rest and soap. So what I've done here, this is, a, and this is a classic example of where it's used, is I've got a, a BizTalk SOAP service exposed. So um, here's all my nice XML to call a SOAP service that everybody loves. So I can call that. And here's my returned XML, so SOAP return. So I've, all I've done is publish my SOAP service through API management. Now I've done that same WSDL, but brought it in and told API management to turn it into a REST service. I haven't touched the BizTalk in the background. It's exactly the same call that I'm making to the BizTalk. But what you'll notice in here now, that's a JSON document that I'm passing it. So I hit that. Yep. The Logix team just got this feature from the API management like so. So, so now it came back. It came back as a um, as a JSON payload, and I I know at least three different projects I did with the previous company where we put BizTalk in so that we could expose SOAP services as REST, and we wrote code, we deployed things. Where now I did an import, told it to do SOAP. Uh, rest the soap, and there it is. So, uh, so you do the mapping between soap yes. and JSON automatically, do you have to define it? Okay, it, it will do a, it, its w interpretation of the mapping to start with. 
So if we go back here to my settings, or actually design, sorry, and then go to the, the, that operation, what we'll notice is we have a, some policies in there. And if we basically open up the policy editor, so basically, this is using a, and I figure out how to get rid of that window, which I can't. They're using that liquid template here, so as you can see, liquid. And basically, what they've done is they are taking in the JSON payload and then creating an actual SOAP envelope and SOAP body, sending it to the web service, and then down here, is where they're getting it back, they're checking to see if there's an error, and then they're doing the same in reverse. So basically, looking at the XML, turning it into JSON, and delivering it. And they do that automatically when you bring the WSDL in. If you want a slightly different um, JSON payload, you can modify this template in here. Yep. And now, just, just a quick one is, here's some of the things that we can do. See all of these different things that we can do? We can do XML to JSON. We can do uh, transforming. We can do the caching. Uh, we can mock a response. So how many times have you gone to somebody and you say, OK, we're going to build some APIs for you. And they say, oh, but our, our phone developers are ready to start working. We need the APIs yesterday. If I have the schema defined, I can go in there, flip a switch, and say mock it, and it will deliver that schema data back to whoever calls the API. And I can have that done in, in hours as opposed to months. Yes? Um, yes and no. <laughs> so um, you can put API management in front of a VNet. So that, but that right now requires a, a, the premium edition. They have promised by the end of the calendar year that it's going to be down in lower editions. So it's going to be cheaper to do that. Um, you can also do um, a couple of different things. You might use a logic app in between, because basically a logic app has access to the on-premise data gateway, which basically is a tunnel that goes through service bus that you run a client on-premise that gives that input, the other end of the endpoint, and that can go to SQL, Oracle, file system, a bunch of different things. So that, and that's a, it's a very easy way to set that up. It doesn't require a VPN, it's just a, a tunnel. So, so just one thing here, just to make clear, we're not deploying your backend API on this thing. It's just a proxy, it's just a gateway, and we do some operations on this gateway. And all these things are the things that we can do with core policies, and some things are all generated for us. There's a lot of, you know, things can be, you can use for a shell, one template to create all these things. You know, it's all ready for automation. Your API is still somewhere deployed by yourself, and this, this is a good example. What I've done is I've run that again, and I've clicked on the trace. And this is basically all the thing that's happening. I'm doing an inspecting on the, yeah. the payload that's coming in. And then basically we get down here, and it's going to go off to my back end. It's going to do a post request. I think that's the question that Joe was asking. Is that the proxy, or was that the... How did he call the, the function? Yeah. So that is the actual endpoint for that. I've got another virtual machine running in Azure that is hosting that BizTalk endpoint. And what's cool stuff, you can change the certification type. So you can talk with your API in so, the the cl Yeah, the classic, the classic thing happens is you turn four different groups of developers loose in your organization and you'll get four different authentication models <laughs> uh, and all of that. So you can actually do stuff in the policies to um, make it all one authentication model. And then you see here it's calling off. Um, it's basically setting up the body as a SOAP body. 
and then it calls the back end. It tells you how many milliseconds it took to call the back end. Um, and then basically, then you'll get the, the data back. And then here's the outbound where it's doing the reverse mapping to JSON. So you get all of this tracing ability as part of API management to find out what's going on. Yes? Yep. Is this tried on real world WSDLs or something that is a bit more? Um, WSDLs an WSDLs an interesting beast. I, I I've been playing with it for a while. There are things that you can do in WSDLs that it might object to. Um, I haven't found anything so far that that I haven't got it to do. Um, so, what's that? schema and things like that. Yeah, so basically most of the applications you have now will give you an option of generating the WSDL file either with external references or all included. If you do the all included, it definitely will handle that. It just depends on whether those external references are accessible. So, um, and those things. I think I'm going to show you a slide. Yep, okay. Just, just like you can see that the external cache preview that the REST cache that you're talking about, that's where you connect with the REST cache. And we have policy here to cache your data as well. Yeah. And what many people do on those policies are a developer deploys an API and forgot to remove some headers. And the header is telling what the technology for the backend API was relevant. And all the ticket guys say that's not going to production because they exposed those headers. And then without you know going to the back to the developer and rebuild everything, we just go here and remove the headers. You know, take like five minutes here, could take you know four hours for the developer to yep. go and rebuild and redeploy. And then you know uh, cache is another thing that the developer haven't done the performance is bad. Someone said that's not good production because performance not going well. Someone just come here, create a cache and performance Good enough to go to production. So there's a lot of things that when you, you start playing with that, you're going to see that you know it helps a lot on the daily things. And, and now with that consumption is there. You know, it's there pretty much for all these functions and you know simple things that people are doing. And then you can go and then move it to another layer. Um, okay. You want to go back? Just to go to the slide. Show that it moved to yeah, another one. Anyone using containers, Kubernetes, or AKS, or Azure? Oh, here. Oh. Here, let me give you this back. <laughs> and, um, yeah, containers just like, let's say there's another way for you to deploy on, on Azure we call AKS. It's a, it's a cluster. Let's say that's your app service. But you know, all using deploy using containers using Docker containers, and you can do the same for you know for API for API management and API management be like your gateway for that. And um, in this example here, without you know virtual network, we could use like what you call a mutual certificate to talk with um, your you know ingress controller of your Kubernetes cluster. That's your like your gateway of your cluster. Pods is the containers, you know, that's the service. One way to do it is just using this, like uh, API management allow mutual certificate. Means that, you know, it's like SSL done on both ways. And means that, um, means that the, the cluster is only going to accept calls from this gateway. You know, you can block this to only accept calls from the API management gateway. And the API management on the policy can set this. So before you call the back end, just set you know, the mutual certificate for that communication. Then the, the client application, they don't know about that. We inject in those certificates before you call the cluster. And that's all done by the API management. And um, if, you, if you try to do that yourself, 
on an application that is not using a mutual certificate, it would be a nightmare to do it, you know, everywhere. And now we, we can do here. Another way, if you're using like premium VNet, say so all your, your uh, gateways deployed inside a private network, you can just call directly there and then you don't need, you know, you can call the service directly and then you, you, you can avoid that. But some people don't want to use a premium layer. Then, I mean, even using the consumption layer that there is no, you know, private network yet, maybe in a feature, we still can use the, the previews option that's uh, the mutual certificate. The product's so flexible that, you know, there is the hours option. We just talk about Azure Functions, SOAP to REST, and, you know, containers with mutual certificate. But there are so many different use cases, and, you know, there's a lot of content. Bill did a lot of blogs I did before as well. Paco, everyone, I think a few guys here wrote things about API management. And just follow this content, and um, I think if we have some minutes for some questions there, that yep. is open for questions, I think that's, that's, I have some links here. Bill is going to, to make those slides public available. Public and those are the main, you know, if you want to take a photo to look tonight, but Bill is going to send you sometime probably tomorrow. And um, yeah. yeah. Thank you and open for questions. And one still web.